So how we can fill the gap? Because insurers, they have a lot of data. There are two big moments when you give data and they can have data and they can be real insurers. So uh, the first moment is when you onboard an insurance, they ask you many questions, around 30 questions in average, like they ask you, how is your house? And they also ask you your age and your job. It's not mandatory, it's not necessary to calculate the price, but it's good to sell you other insurance, like uh, health, for example. So they have the data when you onboard and they have the data of the claims. When you, have a when you fill a claim, it's more data and it's really nice to calculate the risks. So good evening everyone. Um, so yeah, amazing turnout and great to see a lot of you already working in InsureTech uh, or thinking of doing that, so which is really good to see. Um, this is a subject I've been talking about for about four years. Um, it is something that is very close to my heart. I would love to do much more investing in insurance companies. Uh, I've made a couple of investments. I'll talk about one of them in a bit more depth later. Uh, but my appetite to do more in the sector is really high. So what I'm going to quickly do over this sort of 10, 15 minutes is introduce myself, introduce Borderton, uh, and then give a very high level view on the insurance industry which then my um, the three other speakers will go a lot deeper in their particular areas. Um, so who are Bolton? Very quickly, so our mission, first choice for Europe's best founders. We aim to be the leading Series A venture firm across Europe. Some of the companies, been around 20 years, uh, $3 billion, et cetera. Um, this is who the team are. Um, Bernard is our managing partner. He was the founder of Business Objects. Uh, took that to $6 billion acquisition by SAP. Uh, and myself, I was uh, at Google before this. Um, at Google, I helped launch Google Compare, which was Google's effort to get into insurance comparison. Uh, and before that, I was at Bain & Company Consulting and spent a year in Lloyds of London, um, which was fascinating just to see how Lloyds of London worked uh, in the city of London and these people wandering around carrying stacks of paper. Uh, and 17 years on, it hasn't changed. Um, so that's our team. And these are some of our companies. Um, so here are the exits on the left. Uh, I won't talk about those. I think what's more interesting is what we're doing in fintech. Uh, so in fintech, we've been super active. Uh, we're the first investor in Revolut. Uh, first uh, led the Series A in Zigo in insurance. Uh, Nutmeg, Comply Advantage, Prodigy Finance, etc. So that's who we are. Why start a company in insurance? Um, why, why, why bother? Um, so I've written a few posts on this. I've talked about this before. Um, and I start from some really simple facts. Um, so insurance is a trillion dollar business, um, which is built around data and software, or should be built around data and software, um, which has very little innovation happening. It's still done in much the same way it was done 100 years ago, or even 400 years ago, in the coffee houses uh, in the city of London. Uh, when they were insuring merchant ships to go off to the Caribbean and uh, rob the Spanish Armada. It's, 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 it's somewhat, I find it almost bizarre how little innovation has happened in insurance over the years. Uh, and that's what excites me as a VC. I see this huge industry. I see an industry where data, where machine learning, where software can bring huge efficiencies and much better underwriting. Uh, and I see very little startup activity happening. Um, and I really do think tech can really make an impact here. I think there is a little bit of overexcitement at the moment in our industry, in the venture capital, about trying to bring tech to everything, and it's farm tech, and it's food tech, and it's prop tech, and it's... Uh, and I think some of these industries, tech can't bring dramatic changes, whereas in insurance, I think tech can absolutely change the nature of insurance. Uh, and we also face challenged incumbents. So you look at the... Uh, the graph's a bit small, but this is... Um, relative satisfaction of customers um, with the incumbents in different industries. Um, so if you look in, um, in personal banking, they're quite happy. Uh, in airlines, they're not too unhappy. But right down at the right uh, is insurance. People are really unhappy with their insurers. Um, insurers do not have strong customer relationships. So that creates a great opportunity for startups to get in there uh, and build a great relationship with customers and have a disruptive impact. 
So I see uh, there's, there's potential to really change the cost structure of insurers. There's a potential to really change the way they underwrite, the way that insurers write business. And there's an opportunity to own a customer relationship uh, in a way that hasn't happened over time. And insurance is also a completely intermediated uh, industry. Still, a huge amount of the business goes through brokers, particularly um, outside the UK. Uh, and that model has proved incredibly stubborn, uh, incredibly hard to shift. But I find it hard to imagine that a brokered insurance model will be what we look at in 2100. Uh, it's, it's very hard to see how the brokers are really adding value long term. And so I think that's an interesting trend I look at as well. Uh, a VC's view on the insurance market. So you can go offline and find different insurer models of the insurance market, and we talk about capacity and reinsurance and reinsurance brokers and insurers and insurance brokers and then fronters and then MGAs. And so I'm trying to avoid that terminology. I'm trying to look at this as someone who's new to insurance. Um, if I didn't know any of this terminology, any of this jargon, how would I look at the insurance market? Uh, so what I start with is marketing. So how do you get people? How do you find people? Then there's a layer of sales and service. Uh, that can be automated over time. So maybe over time you can just take that layer out completely. There is a layer of administration, which you can also start to automate. Uh, but it's very important in insurance. People change their details. There's always policy changes. You have to get that right. Uh, obviously, the point that really matters is the claims. The whole point of insurance is to be able to claim. So how you manage claims is really the core of insurance. Um, and it's one of the interesting things because you only start paying claims much later on. Um, but in the end, it's what you really get charged by as an insurer. Then there's a data and underwriting question. So in insurance, you call it underwriting. Um, to a machine learning person, it's just data. How do we draw patterns out of that data? Uh, and yeah, there's two layers to this. One is where do you get the data from, which insurers are pretty good at. And the second is what do you do with the data, which startups tend to be very good at. Uh, and finally, you need a big balance sheet. You need a huge chunk of capital to do insurance well. Um, either you have to find that yourself, uh, or you have to get that from existing insurance industry. Either way, this is capital, uh, and there is a cost to that capital. So what's the startup lens on that? How should a startup see this? There's a lot of opportunity. So I take most of the steps in the cycle, and there is opportunity for startups to do things differently or better. Uh, but there are some disadvantages. So in starting with there, the cost of capital, you're always going to have more expensive capital uh, as a startup. Either you get a license, uh, like Alan, who we're talking later, like Zigo, like Lemonade, um, which is great, but you start to raise the capital for that license, and it's uh, a mix of either equity or more expensive debt capital. Compared to Munich Re or Swiss Re, you've got a higher cost of capital. And the other disadvantage you have is data. Some of these insurers have 100 years of historic claims data. Uh, that gives them a great advantage to start with. So that's what you're up against. Um, but the opportunity you have is everything else. Uh, most insurers' marketing sucks. Um, some of them don't bother. Um, sales and service is a great opportunity to automate here. Or if you don't automate, to do it in a much more efficient way, in a much more engaging way. Uh, administration, you can completely automate. You can deliver a great customer experience. Uh, claims, I was uh, speaking uh, with the founder of a company called Bought by Many, which does pet uh, insurance, uh, and they, their main differentiation is around claims. The good thing about pet insurance is you claim all the time, so they can quickly show people what a delight it is to claim. Uh, but that's, the real, that's where the rubber hits the road in insurance. If people have a great claims experience with you, that's when they start telling their friends about this great insurance company. Uh, and then on underwriting. Um, underwriting traditionally is done by actuaries who have done six years of exams and are very intelligent people. Um, but their approach to modeling is based on Excel and is based on linear regression. Uh, and if you can bring modern machine learning to that, you can really start to change the world of uh, underwriting. Other challenges. So it's not all easy. Uh, first challenge, jargon. Um, I've been doing this now for a while, and every time I meet an insurance company, there's still one word which I don't understand. Um, and yeah, when someone fully understands solvency too, I'd love to discuss it over a glass of wine. Um, regulation is obviously very hard in this industry, uh, and there are lots of different levels of regulation. 
uh, so you need to, a point of representative, there are insurance licenses. Uh, in theory, you can passport across Europe. In practice, it's really hard, uh, and really you need to think about this country by country in Europe. Um, but even then, it's still better than the US, because you go to the US thinking you have one market. In insurance, you really don't. Uh, in the insurance, you go to the US and you have 50 states, all of whom have completely different insurance regulation, all of whom where you have to get licensed. So it's a pretty fragmented regulatory space. You need capacity, as I mentioned before. So how are you going to find people to uh, do the claims? So either you get your own license or you have to be uh, an MGA or equivalent structure where you're using someone else's capacity. Um, and that can be hard to find. Uh, the encouraging thing of the last few years is that some of the big reinsurers are really keen to get in startups using their capacity. So uh, Munich Re, Swiss Re, La Parisienne, uh, they're being very supportive uh, and very flexible. Um, the head of Munich Re Digital Partners said, I'm not doing my job properly until I've lost 50 million. Um, so they're really willing to get out there and take some risks and give capacity to some startups and see what happens, uh, which is good to see. Uh, the reality is never quite as smooth as that. There's always some risk committees and you have to go through a few layers and they're a big corporate. Um, but the, the impetus is there, which is good to have. Uh, and then finally, historic claims data. So if you're going to start pricing insurance, you need to understand what the normal claims rate is and some idea what your loss ratio will be. Will you actually make money doing this? Um, but insurers guard this very closely. So what we tend to see is uh, startups bootstrapping. They hire some people out of insurers and try to use their received wisdom, uh, or they try and get some data from their capacity provider, but some way to get going. So that's my very high level view. Um, I think what's more interesting is to look at some of the insure tech businesses of the last few years um, and try to give a bit of inspiration and I guess my view on them as a, a venture capital investor uh, around some of the things were happening. As I say, this sector is still super early. So I compare to FinTech, uh, I compare to a lot of other tech sectors, there's much less happening here. So overall, huge opportunity. But there are a few companies which are starting to scale and, and attract money. Uh, the biggest is a Chinese company called Zhongan, um, which is, when I wrote this presentation, a $5 billion market cap. It was at peak a $10 billion market cap company. Um, it was only founded six years ago. It has sold billions of policies. Um, what it started off doing was uh, returns insurance. Uh, so if you um, ordered a package and you wanted to return it to have insurance, you could do so without any cost. Um, they were able to plug into all the online marketplaces to do that, so they had a very good distribution channel. Um, they had Ping An, Alibaba, and Tencent as investors and also strategic partners, which is very helpful. Uh, but the speed they scaled is amazing. Uh, and they have now gone into everything. They want to do every sort of insurance for everyone across China. Uh, so the scale of ambition is really high. Um, I think why the share price is halved is um, they need to show that they can deliver in those areas and that they can be a profitable insurer in all these areas, not just about growth. Uh, Lemonade, I'm sure most of you have heard of, um, probably the highest profile US uh, insure tech. Um, wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago that it's the latest state of the nation. And it's good. I mean, uh, they are... They're going after US uh, renters and homeowners insurance. Um, it's a good category. They are building a brand, uh, and they're going out there to build a real brand with consumers. Um, they've raised 480 million to throw at that, uh, and they need a lot of money. If you're gonna try and build an insurance brand in the US, you need to throw a lot of money above the line. Uh, and they're at 50 million in premiums, which is good, but it's tiny, really. Um, in the great scheme of things, uh, and also versus having raised 500 million. So still early days, but uh, in terms of the ambition, in terms of the team, quite impressive. Um, and they are just started coming to Europe, but uh, in a very small way. Uh, Root, uh, the other famous US uh, company, so they're doing usage-based car insurance, uh, also raised about 500 million. Um, have actually more impressive data in terms of loss ratio, in terms of growth and lemonade. Um, question mark, so, so they try and use telematics, so understanding how you drive to do a data-based approach to insurance. Um, question marks on how much that's really the case, as opposed to just being a, 
a smart distribution channel. Um, they're quite interesting. Um, and I think when you look in general at insurance, I look at where can data bring insights and where can you do new things with data. Um, and I think around driving, you can, there's a first generation of telematics companies which show it works, but there's a lot more that can be done in motor insurance. Uh, WeFox uh, is probably the biggest in Europe right now, uh, based in Germany. Uh, quite a complex company. Uh, so started off as an insurance wallet. You'd put all your insurance policies in a mobile app, uh, and then you have this um, consolidation as a client to make it much easier for you. You can manage all your policies in one place. Um, also work with existing offline brokers, have launched their own insurance carrier, have their own license. Uh, do their own uh, liability insurance. Um, quite interesting business. Also quite interesting to look at insurance in Germany and Switzerland. Um, so this concept of liability insurance is something that everyone in Germany has. Uh, no one in the UK has. I don't think many people in France have this, but it's, it's interesting how entire personal lines exist in one European country and don't exist in others. Uh, and then the, the company I'm on the board of is Zigo. Uh, so Zigo is a UK company. Uh, started a few years ago doing insurance for Deliveroo drivers. Uh, now broadened off into doing Uber, into doing e-scooters, into doing um, flexible car fleets, uh, van insurance, fleet insurance, so any form of commercial motor. Uh, so again, doing smart things around data and telematics, uh, really going after the commercial motor insurance. Um, that's one of the things I like here is that we see quite a lot of activity around um, personal insurance lines, but half of the insurance market is commercial. Um, and I'd love to see more companies going after the commercial insurance market because it's, it's big, uh, and generally the margins are more attractive. Uh, and Zigo has been scaling really well, raising lots more money, expanding across Europe, so it's been, a, it's been a good story to be part of. We definitely got things wrong along the way as well, which I can tell you about over a beer, um, but overall a very positive story. So that was it. Um, we have Q&A at the end, so I won't do questions now. Um, but I'll now hand over to Covered, All right? Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Uh, thanks, uh, Rob, for your presentation. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Covered. And I'm very happy to introduce you to my whole team. Actually, we are five. Uh, we launched in uh, April of this year, so this is the very, very beginning. Uh, and I think I will be the only one uh, able to present my whole team on a slide for tonight. Anyway, uh, we are five focusing since six months uh, for this pain market, which is your smartphone is weak. And just before we start, I got a question for you. Who already broke a phone? Please raise your hand. Okay, so almost everybody. So please do not subscribe COVID. This product is not for you. <laughs> Seriously, uh, as you understood now, uh, Covered is a mobile phone insurance, new, gen new generation of it. So you're, we are providing coverage for all the incidents you could have with your phone, uh, damage for breakage issues, uh, water, electricity, theft, and for sure, we are going beyond the coverage and product with some additional product and services like accessories or online support. But now the question you all have is, why should I buy this insurance? This is the main subject here. We are selling optional insurance. When you are buying a home insurance, you are buying it first because you need to buy it. Because in France, you need to have a home insurance. So maybe you will buy a local coverage because uh, of the UX, because of the price, because of the coverage. But you need to buy one. When you're selling optional insurance, you need to convince people that they need 
the product. So one step ahead. And the second problem, and this one is for the wall of us as insurers and brokers, is people do not like us. Okay? We see insurers and brokers like that. And you know this scene of this famous movie. Why? Because if you don't claim, and if your insurer or broker do not treat a claim on the right way for you, you think you just spent money for nothing. This is the main problem on our market. And so, how will you do to make those people like your brand, buy your product, and buy your product not just because you need it, because in my case, my product is not mandatory. So how will you brand, will you do brand awareness on insurance? My first point is on the product. And this is for the world of us, if you are building a startup in insurance, and all that I will talk tonight is for the B2C side, okay, just to, just to give you a notice. Uh, I'm distributing covered directly with direct marketing, with partnerships, but we are not a white label company. We're addressing end customers. So all this topic is around brand awareness for end customers. First, build a great product. This is very, very important. And what do I mean by building a great product in insurance? First, the policy. You need the best coverage for the best price. And you can't say that because you are an insert tech, because you are going digital, because you are cool, because you have great UX, you could have a, an average policy. You need to have the best one. And if you have different segments, address the different segments with different best products. Second, claims. Treat claims instantly. Please do not use call centers, do not use paper. Everything online, everything now, over communicated with the, with the customers. Third, explain your cost and revenues. You are on a market where people don't understand. They are just paying for something they just don't understand. You are buying an insurance choosing the same as your parents, your family, your friends, because you don't understand. You just know that you need one, so you buy one, okay? Give them explanations on cost, revenues, where are your revenues, or what they are paying for. And a customer who understands that will be your customer. And fourth, so this is a plus, this is like a, a signature for your product, and we do it at Covered. If you can have a short-term contract on your insurance for B2C uh, vertical, this is very important, uh, try to do it. So this was about the product, build a great product. Second, how to make people buy your product if they don't understand the risk? If they don't understand the risk, just communicate on the risk, but don't do it like very big insurance cooperatives are doing. Don't do uh, TV ads with very corporate uh, video productions. Do it your way. Do it human. Do it to your, to your level. Uh, and uh, as an example at Corvid, so we are covering smartphones. Um, when a new smartphone is launched, we are buying it the first day. We are crushing it uh, on the floor, uh, putting it on the water, we are testing everything, filming everything, and spreading the world to our community, to our leads. And so people understand why they are buying cover, and they are sharing the videos. Third, and this will be a topic for Alan Oliko, I think, after, uh, but I needed to talk a minute of it. Go beyond product and coverage. You need to build a product people will be able to buy without the insurance coverage. Service, uh, transparency, products, all 
this universe you are building around your product should be with a higher value than just the coverage. And more than anything, bet on NPS, bet on claimers. The best brand ambassadors for your brand are the claimers in insurance because they are the people who can tell to everybody what occurred the day they claim. So focus on claimers, uh, make it the first KPI of your company. You can have a high growth, a low growth, whatever. If you want to stay uh, on long term, you need to be focused on claimers because this is the first thing why people are buying your product. So thank you everyone. Now you know Crowbird, you know that you can subscribe it. It was a joke, sure. So do it with pleasure. And now we are introducing Lea from Luco. Hi, thank you. I'm very happy to, to be here to talk to you about uh, Luco. So today I will talk to you about how to build an insurance without data and without capital. And uh, to, to fit with the Luco story is uh, how to get 20,000 clients without this historical data and uh, capital. So first, home insurance. Home insurance and insurance is about risk, people, you aggregate all of this and these people should pay the price you calculate to get cover for the risk. So to build an insurance, you know, you don't, you have to know the people, know the risk and you have to have the funds and the capital to be able to reimburse, to pay back those people. At Luco, when we begin in uh, one year ago, we didn't have historical capital and we didn't, uh, we didn't have historical data and we didn't have capital. But yet, I'm here tonight, we're here tonight and maybe some of you are insured at Luco and 20,000 people are insured at Luco. So, tonight, I will explain our position about capital and about historical data and I will explain to you how you can build an insurance without these two and how you can build it beyond contracts and beyond insurance. <laughs> I think it will be all about go beyond insurance tonight with Covered, <laughs> with Luco and with Alan. So, Luco and Capital. We are going to stay here. So, uh, when, you are, when you want to insure people, you need two stuff. You need a license, so you can go for accreditation and, or you can have a white label license. And the second thing you need to have to insure people is, is capital. You need to have big funds to insure people in case there is a problem. For instance, in home insurance, you need to have approximately 20 million euro sleeping on a bank account to have the necessary funds to have an accreditation and a license to insure people. So, at Luco, we decided to be an MGA, Managing General Agent. It means that we partnered with big reinsurers, the strongest and the biggest in the world, Munich Re and Swiss Re. And these reinsurers gave us the, we can have their license and capital to build the product. So at Luco, we are focusing on building a product, building the right pricing, and manage the risk, lower the risk, and go to market, and distribute the, pro the product. So we decided to not go for accreditation and to focus and growth and to how to make a, a good insurance product. It's a strong choice and it's because we are strongly believing that Insurance is not only about innovation in insurance, it's not only about how you can innovate about the legal, about the license, it's also how you can have innovation and impact to lower and to manage the risk. I can take a, a simple example, but if you want to cover bikes to have a nice bike insurance, do you want, it's, it's the best way to, in, uh, to 
invest about how to protect, how to lower the risk about the seas of the of the bike, how to to build a, a good uh, GPS tracker, or it's best to invest on having a license. We think it was the best to invest on building the product and to innovate and how to manage and lower the risk. So that's for capital. Uh, second, historical data. So how we can fill the gap? Because insurers, they have a lot of data. There are two big moments when you give data and they can have data and they can be real insurers. So uh, the first moment is when you onboard an insurance, they ask you many questions, around 30 questions in average, like they ask you how is your house, and they also ask you your age and your job. It's not mandatory, it's not necessary to calculate the price, but it's good to sell you other insurance, like uh, health, for example. So they have the data when you onboard, and they have the data of the claims. When you, have a cla when you fill a claims, it's more data and it's really nice to calculate the risks. So at Lugo, we didn't have any of those at the beginning, but you can easily fill the gap. How you can fill the gap? The first thing is to be good at techno and to be good with the data. So you can scrap the open base data, you can pay the reinsurance to have access to, the, to their big database, and uh, you can scrap uh, your challenger sitweb to get uh, the price, the risk, and to retroingenize their model to get all the data you want. And second, to get the data, you can ask your customers and make it the right thing at the beginning and make the data the richer you can at the beginning. For example, at Luco, we made the choice that 100% of the insurance is sold on our website. The, this is the only channel to buy insurance. So the, the market di the distribution is not spread out as it is in the insurance company. If you are a big insurance, you can, sell your in you can sell your insurance on your website, you can sell your insurance with brokers on white labels, so the data is spread out. But on Luco, you can only buy the insurance on the website, and we made our client precisely locate their house on the map. You can see it here. It's very important because when you onboard your house, you have to precisely locate it on the house. You can select the different parcels you own, and then with the computer vision, we can calculate the exact surface of uh, the, the area is yours, and we can calculate if you have a pool, we can calculate the surface of the roof, and really important, we can calculate the risk. We know precisely where you are. We know if you are down the river, up the river, we have really rich data and everything is collected. So we, we see that you can build an insurance and get insurance without this capital and without this historical data. How you can do it? You, it's important because everyone can do it now. Everyone can, can, can do like us, everyone can scrap website, can have historical data, everyone can have the license of a reinsurer. You can do that, but if you want that the people buy your insurance, you have to do really something new. You have to be beyond the insurance contract. So, no need for historical data. And there is the, the question, who has the best contract? Who has the best guarantees? Because I, I want to make my choice on that. Mm, there is not, not a clear answer to that because everyone is doing the same. All the contracts are quite similar in the assurance. The only difference is the price. So to make the good people like you choose my insurance, I have to do something different. I have to offer you new stuff. And it's quite difficult because insurance market, it's a low, low differentiation and low engagement mar market. The people don't like insurance because insurance reminds you of bad stuff in life, like disease, death, disaster, accident, flooding. It's not a good, it's not a good thing, insurance. It's not the, the best part of your life. And people are not interested in, in, in insurance. 50% of the people are with the same insurance since 10 years and only 11% of the people consider to change their insurance. It's not a subject. But yet, if you want to build a good insurance and if you want to attract people, you need engagement and customer love. 
So that's what we want to build at Lico. That's why we want to attract engagement and customer love. That's what we think we have to go beyond the coverage and to move the model of insurance. Before, the model of insurance was a um, reaction model based on claims. You have a problem, the insurance is here. The insurance exists. But now we think it's time to change this view on insurance. And insurance should be, should be at the beginning. Insurance should be all about prevention. So it's like it said, instead of selling a financial con contract, Luca wants to prevent and to solve accident, to be here when you did it the most. Because, because it's the winning point. <laughs> So how, how we do that today, we are trying to transform your home insurance into an ally. So there is three main things. There is prevention, there is new services, and there is building trust. About prevention, it's about help you to monitor your home and to be here before the problem happens. So I have something. <laughs> Thank you. We have this. So if you want to open it and share it. <laughs> we are building technologies at Luco that you can install on your door, on your electric meters, and your, on your water pipe to monitor your home and your consumption. And it's the, the purpose is to avoid the flooding, to avoid the fires, and to avoid burglaries. It's really important for us that the people um, felt concerned by the house and try to protect the house. It's really important that you are not just the people who has for a claim, that you are the people who think about its uh, nest. And we want to protect your nest and to give you good advice to don't have accidents. But if you do have accidents, of course we will be here, we will help you. And we are developing a lot of new services. It's the second thing, because you have, when you are building a home insurance, you have to be more present. You, are to, you have to set regular touch points. You have to be in the daily life of, of your user, because I don't, I don't know if you have these numbers in mind, but today you are going to speak for a claim to your insurer just one time over 10, 10 years. So you don't really speak to your insurance. You only speak to your insurance when you have a claim or when there is a problem on the bill. But you don't have any contact with your home insurance. So we need new services to really be in the life of the user and to really be an ally. Regular touch points. So at Luco, we imagine different things. And I have, I have put here three, three of these initiatives. For example, the first one with the little bike, it's called Lucky. So you can give us a, sp a spare key, and if you are locked out, we will come with our bike and deliver you the spare key. So we won't have to, to break your door, you won't have to, to call uh, someone who will cost you like 100 euros to, to make you uh, go to your home. Uh, second, sir, second things, we have a, a repairman services in your application. If you want to, to build a new thing at home and you don't have the right craftsmen, we can uh, put you in relation with the, the good people. And uh, we are always developing new services to better handle the claim. Uh, for example, if you have a problem, we can pay you back directly and instantaneously with Lydia. So it's all about services. It's about bringing something new for the people that they have a really interest in coming to Luco. And the third thing, which is really important also, is building trust. Because as we said, people don't like insurance and people don't trust insurance. Because insurance... Sorry. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we have a new compensation... We, we decided of a new compensation model. It's quite little here. So our compensation model work uh, this way to have back the transparency in the insurance. So you have your, you have your premium. On your, pre on your premium, there is 30% for Luco. It's to pay Luco, to handle your claim, to develop technologies. And the other 70% are gathered with all the insurance and it's dedicated to pay your claims. If you have a problem, you can have this money. And at the end of the year, if there is leftovers, we gave it to the charity you choose when you subscribe to Luco. This way, Luco has no in interest in not reimburse you 
because this money is not for us. If there is leftovers, it's not profit for Luco. It's only for you, your claims, or the charities. And you, people, you don't have to fraud, because if you fraud, you don't fraud us. You fraud the charities. So it's a virtual cycle for all of us, and it's better that you know where your money is going. If you are doing all of this, you can have what we talk about, you can have engagement, and you can have customer love. And you can have other benefits that are really interesting, like you waste less money on acquisition and ads to get people. People from, come from the good reason. They don't come because you, have your because you have the better price. They come because of your services. They come because of your engagement. And uh, the people are engaged. They are, they, there is a lot of fidelity. And thanks to the prevention, there is less, less accidents and frauds. So more happy injuries. Uh, we, we do all of this at LUCO since our first years, we are really happy, and this model proves itself. So on the acquisition part, we have two times to three times lower acquisition costs than the average market. Uh, we have a lot of trust, a lot of word of mouth, and a strong growth due to organic, uh, organic channels. And we have very good technical reasons, thanks to the, the prevention. Some, uh, some, some statistics about the NPS. The average NPS in home insurance is about 15. At LUCO, it's 72 and 75 after claims. Thank you all for listening to me. Uh, there is a promo code if you like LUCO. <laughs> and now it's time for Mihaila. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mihaela. Uh, I am sales strategy at Allen. And um, I think there is, a, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, tonight about a theme that seems to have been recurring in the other uh, discussions as well, which is going beyond the insurance, going beyond coverage. Um, I do think Allen is an interesting example um, because we actually, you might see us as an insurance company, but we're actually a healthcare company. So from that perspective, I think we are going as much as possible beyond coverage. Um, I'll, I'll start a bit differently than the other team members. So I'll start you from our uh, vision and uh, the beyond the insurance part. And then I'll, I'll, I'll roll back and talk about the insurance, which probably most of you want to, want to hear about. Um, but I do want to start about our vision so that you get to know us a bit better for the ones who don't know us yet. Um, and because I think it's, it's very relevant for what we're trying to do even right now and what we're embedding in our product and our go-to-market. Um, so we, we're, our vision is a healthcare uh, vision. We want to be your friend in health, your partner for better living. Um, the reason why we think this is an important need, there is a need for, for a company to do this, um, is because health systems right now are not actually delivering the right service, the right value uh, to anyone part in the system. And it's not something specific to a friend system, it's actually something more global. And we think that actually addressing this problem, this is a much more interesting, bigger and meatier problem to address. Um, because, it, uh, because of the size of the problem, the size of the market, and the fact that actually it affects uh, most, of the, most of the players in the system. Um, how we think we can actually solve this problem um, is by uh, enabling fluid and fair healthcare for everyone. Um, and I know that there's, there are big words, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of companies put big words in their, in their mission, but um, I'll come back to these words uh, later on down the presentation, because they actually do trickle down very clearly in our product roadmap, for example, and in our go-to-market. Um, but this is for us um, the, the, end, the, the end game, and actually even the aim, the objective that we have right now. Um, to get there, we've actually started by building a health insurance company. Uh, why health insurance? Um, first of all, because the positioning of health insurance on the value chain in healthcare is actually a very interesting one, because we are at the center of the whole system. We're connected with the users directly, we're connected with the providers, 
and we're connected with the system, so it's secure. Um, and at the same time, we're at the intersection of different flows of data and, uh, and, and revenue. So we thought that this is actually a very interesting place to start our healthcare journey. And in addition to that, um, the health insurance or the insurance model um, gives us a very stable business model for now. It's a recurrent business model um, and it provides us with stability so that we can build on that uh, more healthcare related product and actually go towards building a healthcare company. Um, a few figures here for um, some of you who might not know us. Um, we've been, uh, we're four years right now. We've been uh, the first health insurance company to be, a uh, new health insurance company to be approved in France in 30 years. Uh, we right now insure 62,000 uh, lives. Um, we have uh, approximately 50 million of uh, annual recurring revenue and we've grown the team to 130 people. Um, we're a post-series B company, uh, we've uh, raised 75 million for now and a lot of it was due to this insurance, this, this backbone of insurance um, that precisely as I mentioned allows us to have a strong foundation to build on um, for, um, for our vision. Um, now, going beyond the coverage, again, the leitmotiv of, uh, of tonight, um, I, will, uh, I will talk a bit more concretely about um, how we're actually moving the discussion beyond uh, guarantees and prices. Um, and um, maybe to start with, though, uh, the coverage. Um, to actually be able to move the discussion to where you think you add value um, and to be able to rip the benefits from, from that, that, val that, that value pool, um, you still need to deal with the coverage, the, the basic coverage, the basic insurance. And the best way to deal with that is to actually make it very simple, make it almost no-brainer from a customer perspective. Um, and that's how we've built our insurance product. It's a very simple, um, a product, uh, product portfolio, usually it has two main products, a good one and a premium one. Um, and as we go up market, we start building flexibility into it, but it's actually much more internal flexibility and towards the customers, it always remains uh, a simple choice. So we put in front of the customer uh, one or maximum two choices that we think they're best suited for them. Um, and the other thing that we do, we do actually uh, integrate in our insurance products some selected guarantees that are differentiated. So, for example, uh, Medicine Dus. Um, so, once we actually, uh, in a way, address and, and make the insurance product um, appealing, um, we work on, we, we try to move the discussion away from that. And the way to do that, so there's, there's three important things to do. First of all, it's the product. Second is your go-to-market, and third is the brand. And I'll walk in detail through, um, through each of them. Um, the product. Um, so to be able to actually have a value proposition that goes beyond coverage, you need to build value beyond coverage, which means that actually you need to build a product that delivers value beyond just the, the, the insurance, the pure insurance part. Um, and the way we do it, we actually defined uh, a very clear product strategy and uh, three core pillars um, that are fluid, fair, and partner in health. Um, so what we're doing here, we're actually taking our mission and putting it very concretely, concretely in our product strategy and product roadmap. Um, what, does, what does fluid mean for us and how we deliver value through fluid? Uh, fluid means for us that you get the fastest and most reliable uh, service. Fair means, am I doing this? Okay. Um, fair means that uh, you trust us to give you the best value for money. And partner in health means that uh, your life, when it comes to health and well being, it's 10 times easier uh, with us. Now, I, I think it might be a simplistic point to actually say, well, you need to, de to develop a product that goes beyond coverage. Um, but one of the things that we, we do is actually um, we define every quarter what does it mean for us, what do we need to deliver every quarter 
to deliver value in each of those different pillars. Um, and um, so to give you an example, uh, most reliable product and service might mean next quarter to have fully internalized claims. It might mean in a year to have instant reimbursement on your claims. The moment you, the moment you, uh, you go to the doctor, you have it reimbursed. Um, so we keep, we, we make sure that we deliver on them every single quarter. Um, here is just, I'm gonna go quite quick through it. This is like, these are some of examples of, um, of what value we deliver beyond, beyond the basic products. So the first one is accurate reimbursement. Um, because we're internalizing uh, almost full ER claims management by now, uh, mobile first, unique customer care, um, and partner in health. There's a couple of example services that we have, but I'll go quite quickly through them. Um, now, so to come back, product, uh, go to market, and, um, uh, and brand. Um, on the go-to-market side, um, there's a few very important things to actually address. Um, you have the product, but that doesn't mean necessarily that you're able to sell it um, to customers who have actually not been educated, not used to uh, being sold uh, the certain value proposition that you want to put forward. Um, so what we think is key, um, first of all, uh, market, um, sorry, first of all, market segmentation. Um, so you have to start with the customer segments that are much more prone to actually react to your value proposition. Um, and at least for us, those are usually companies that, uh, sectors that are structurally more digitally savvy, tech savvy, younger sectors. But there are also sectors in which there is a problem beyond coverage. Um, so for example, in uh, the hotel and restoration segment, um, there is a massive problem with managing health insurance from an administrative perspective, so onboarding, offboarding people. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that we've done. Um, we've actually defined very clearly the segments that we want to target, and we're getting every year smarter on how to better identify them. So initially we started with basic indicators like age of a company, location. Now we're using a lot of tools to actually scrape information, looking at uh, technologies that a company has, for example, on their website, uh, micro segments based on, on industry sectors, etc. cetera. Um, once you have that part, so the segments that will be more responsive to your value proposition, um, the other thing that's very important is to actually build a messaging that conveys that value proposition. Um, and I'm, I'm showing you to two examples of how we, um, how we message our products. They're for different customer segments. So the first one is the message around um, uh, employee well-being and about simplicity. So there's nothing around value for money or price in there. This is usually something that resonates best with um, smaller companies, modern companies, all, or larger companies that are particularly interested in, in employee well-being, like consulting companies. The other example is an example of a messaging that's around simplicity and connectivity. Again, nothing to do with the, the actual value and price. We've realized that this uh, particular message resonates with the hotels and restaurant segments, where they're extremely busy. All they want is something that's you know no 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 brainer and and easy to manage on an ongoing basis. So very important that you um, that you have the 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 right messaging um, on the value proposition that you on the value that you you think you're creating. Um, and last but not least, maybe um, sometimes understated, we think that our sales approach is actually a way to, uh, to move beyond coverage. Um, we've defined our sales approach as um, smart and soft. Um, what that means from a smart perspective, it means that we actually talk about more than guarantees. We're able to talk about uh, employee health being, we're able to talk about uh, the administ administrative part of health insurance. Um, and soft means that we have a transparent and healthier tone when we, uh, when we sell insurance to differentiate ourselves from the traditional brokers. We do maintain a counseling angle that most of the traditional brokers or insurance have. They position themselves as having close customer relationships. So we, we do maintain that because it's important for customers and it's still aligned with how we want to, uh, to sell. Um, 
And last but not least, um, we think it's very important to actually build a brand that goes beyond uh, insurance, uh, and in this case, even beyond health insurance. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen our um, TV campaign. Um, we, com we try to communicate as much as possible on our long-term version for health. Uh, in some cases, actually, people um, came to us and said, well, it's kind of disconnected from the fact that you're selling health insurance right now, um, which is actually what we're trying to do because we are, we're trying to build a brand for the long term. And we're going to reap the benefits, not necessarily this year, but in one or two years. Um, and we're going to continue to communicate on that. Um, to, uh, to close, I think maybe, so to summarize the different points that I've made, um, first of all, you know, we are a healthcare company uh, that's particular to us. Uh, and then maybe some learnings for you um, to go beyond coverage. First of all, simplify the coverage, make it a no brainer for, um, for the customer. Work relentlessly on your product because you have to actually be able to deliver real tangible value beyond coverage um, so that it, it, it's not just words. Um, next point is build a go-to-market strategy that's in sync with the value that you want to deliver. Um, and uh, last but not least, build a brand um, that's about more than insurance. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, to Hugo, Leah, and Mahela for some great talks and some great, very practical advice, I think, in terms of building some of the uh, three of the most exciting uh, French in source like success stories. Um, so, great to hear those ideas. I think the idea we're going to have a short panel, but what I'd love to get is questions from the crowd. So, start thinking what you'd like to learn from these people, maybe some provocative questions you want to ask. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get us going. So I guess a uh, question for Hugo to start with, but then everyone is, all three talks today have been not about insurance, about how can we be more than just being an insurer. Um, does that mean we just need to give up on insurance and we just need to talk about protection or talk about health? Uh. It works, yeah. Um, I think it was a question for Leah, uh, speaking yeah. on preven prevention, because this is really, really mark on, on your branding. Uh, yes, I think that working on prevention could be a solution for insurance, uh, no, not dropping insurance and coverage product for sure, but there is clearly a part of your product which could be services which could be products more oriented. And to, be, um, to make an example with COVID, we, we had this question at the very beginning, six months ago. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> we had this question, which was, do we want to build an insurance product or more like a subscription service product, mm -hmm. doing all by ourselves? And today we know that the uh, the partnerships with an insurer when you are going to market is very, very strong. So uh, you are working on, uh, on going uh, for the license, no? For next year, maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is plans, long-term plans. Um, I mean, I can, I can say something. I think I, I mostly talked about the beyond the insurance part because that was the theme of the discussion. I haven't actually talked about the fact that, you know, right now at the core, we, we do have an insurance offer and we work to innovate on the insurance side as well. Um, so everything in terms of what we do on the back end side on claims management and, uh, you know, being able to fully reinvent that and do potentially in instant reimbursement. Uh, we do also a lot of work on how can we have the health part actually help us with the loss ratio on the, on the, on the, on the claim side, so actually uh, decrease our cost there. Um, so to your point, should we all get out of insurance? I, uh, <laughs> that was not really for, for us for the point of uh, my, my, my presentation. I think we as a company, Alan, uh, has decided to take on the challenge of healthcare, but I think there's a lot of very interesting and innovative things that can still be done on the 
pure core insurance part, and I think that's necessary to be able to provide that foundation to, to, build, to build beyond it. So, so like that. Yes, we are quite close to Alain uh, on that vision. And for Duco, since the beginning, we, we never wanted to be an insurance. We are a protection service, and there is the protection, the prevention, and the insurance is, the, is a part of protection. Uh, you need to be uh, like financially protected, and it's what you have with the insurance, with the funds that pay you back if you have a problem. But for us, the whole part is not uh, only about insurance. It's a... Uh, uh, an important part. We, we are very focused on it, but uh, it's not all. Very cool. Um, and when do you, th I mean, you talk about how can you make loss ratios lower through the protection side? Um, when do you think you would be able to show that and say, Luco, Alan, Calvert have shown that we're low, our loss ratios are 10% lower because we have great smart devices or we do great things around healthcare? We have to prove it. We have to prove it because uh, at Luco, it's uh, the protection part is on beta test, and we are going to send all the sensors in the in the next coming months. So we have to prove that this protection part works. But there is also uh, another thing which is important: it's the mindset. If you include all the people in a prevention mindset, in a mindset when you take care of your place, it's really good, it's really virtuous for the home and for the loss ratio as well. You don't uh, really, you, you, you need to have the protection uh, pieces, but you can only be in a good mindset. I mean, from from Alan's perspective, I think to to give a specific timeline, it's uh, it's a bit tricky, but it's something that we're already so we already have objectives right now that are around uh, our margin. Whereas until recently, uh, we mostly focused on user growth. Right now, we actually have almost on equal side a margin objective. Um, we're working on on two fronts on reducing the um, the loss ratio. Um, one of them is uh, actually on fraud um, and on how do we think about our guarantees and our pricing to actually be able to decrease that. Um, the part where the health services will kick in, uh, it's probably going to be a bit longer term because we are, we're, still, we're still building that offer. Got it. So that we, yeah. it, so the health part can actually significantly influence um, um, the claims. I think the advantage for, for you is also you can be, have positive risk selection so the people signing up for your services are hopefully good risks. They're young, healthy people, or they're people who actually look after their place, and therefore should be a lower loss ratio. I think that's clearly what we've seen until now. I think with the ambition that we have is to actually go way beyond the startup scene, young companies, yeah. where, yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where that, that looks particularly positive. But definitely that was something that helped us uh, a lot until now and, and helped us build. I yeah, think yeah. longer term we need to find different ways to uh, tackle that more sustainably than just by um, yeah. like customer selection, let's say. Actually, just on that side, and there's some people here with very early stage companies. How did you, your companies, acquire your first 100 customers? Maybe Hugo first, sort of, what's the, yeah, how do you bootstrap to start with? Uh, quite hard, <laughs> <laughs> quite hard. The first 100 are really, really the hardest one, I think. Um, because you need to, to test, bootstrap a lot of stuff. Um, paid acquisition actually was good for us, uh, okay. like uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, nothing on Google, but, uh, but uh, paid ac acquisition was good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Larry. Um, the main part was the value proposition for us to, to bring something new on the table, something simpler, something really easy to subscribe. It was the first home insurance in France you can subscribe in two minutes. It was the first satellite onboarding for houses. So they were a real innovation. And, and did that get PR? Was that what got the word out? Yeah. API. PR, like the, the newspapers yes. were writing about yes, it? Yes, the, okay. the, the PR so was you good too. Yeah. We, we are PR and... Um, a lot of partnership too, because uh, as we say, you don't really want to change or to find an insurance. There is a tipping point, like when you are moving, you are looking for a new insurance. So we partnered a lot with uh, movers, with renters, with the people in the in the good point for a change mm -hmm. of insurance. How do you, how do you think about partnerships? I think you, 
Uh, Zhong Am, that I mentioned earlier, has grown almost entirely through partnerships. Um, and it's easy to see insurance as almost an API that triggers. Like when I buy a mobile phone, it should automatically trigger covered insurance. Uh, and when I start renting my flat, I should automatically trigger Luco. When I start a company, I should automatically trigger Alan. Do you, how important do you see partnerships? Or do you think actually we have to build our own brand and therefore we have to go to the customer ourselves? Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, about partnership, I think it's very really important. The brand is very really important, of course, because we are B2C companies. We need to convince people and we need to reinsure people. But uh, for Luco, partners and API uh, point of view is very really important because we think that insurance won't be any more horizontal like it is uh, right now. You have uh, a big insurance companies that are doing health insurance, uh, car insurance, home insurance. And uh, we think that insurance will be more special, specialized, will be more on vertical. So for Luco, we are focusing on the house. We are going to be specialists of the house and you can protect your house with insurance, with other things. And in the future, when you will buy a car, and it's already the case with Tesla, you are buying the insurance that's come along, and it will be the same with Alan, with the, the health sector, the health vertical and the insurance. Um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't actually prioritized partnerships um, because we wanted, first of all, to, to build our own muscle. Um, and I also think that um, the value proposition that we have for partners is more appealing as we grow than it would have been uh, initially. Um, so right now we're looking more strategically at partnerships. We've done a couple of partnerships, maybe more opportunistically uh, initially. Um, we have a we have a good partnership. The one that's actually the strongest is the the one with PayFit, um, and that's been both a, a product integration partnership uh, as well as a commercialization one. Um, but we have not that that was not one of our our, our main um, growth drivers. Um, we've we've acquired uh, um, organically initially, and since last year we have a sales team in in place that's. Um, that's grown quite significant, uh, significantly over the past two years. But I think we're going to start looking much more, much more strategically at, at partnerships right now um, to scale. Yeah, when you're working on B2C like Luco and Crover, this is really essential because B2C direct marketing is really good for, for the show, uh, but, but the big volume is in partnerships. And I think this is really something comp complementary. So you're working on both sides at the same time. And, and uh, for COVID, uh, the moment you're able to buy a COVID subscription is the moment you swap your phone, you change, you upgrade. So we need to, to, to go to people selling mobile phone, as an example, and make partnerships with them. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I guess, yeah, one more question before we go to the, to the audience. Um, which I think is the license versus non-license question. So I think Alan started with a license. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to get your reflections on that. Do you think that was the right move for Alan? And then to compare to Luco Covered, where have, they've taken a different approach of launching first. So yeah, what was your, what's the Alan perspective on, was it the right thing to get a license up front? Yeah, I think uh, from our perspective, it was uh, it was clearly the right the right thing. I think uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the challenges that you know might might stop startups initially. It's the it's the capital part, and I think we were able to uh, to overcome that. Um, and it also helped us a lot in in getting credibility and building credibility and trust with um, with prospects uh, initially uh, the first reaction that we had from companies is like but you're basically a broker and the moment we were able to tell them no actually we are the first health insurer in france to be uh, accredited in 30 years and we are an end-to-end -end insurer and we bear our risk and we know what we're doing and this is our uh, leadership team it just it it has it, we have different discussions with customers. Um, I was not there at the beginning when the choice was made, but looking back, I think it was definitely uh, the, the the best choice to, uh, Got to it. make. Makes sense. And from a Luco perspective, is it something you're thinking of? I and mean, Hugo hinted at <laughs> it already, but uh, yeah. 
Yeah, we, we are thinking of this perspective, like I said, not in 2020, but 21, I think. And I as explained, it was not uh, the main focus for mm -hmm. Luco because uh, we, we have the chance to find really good reinsurers to partner with. And they are, they are really nice. We, we have a confident relationship. We can really rely on their capital and on their license and, we, and work, work in hand, hand, hand on hand to build the insurance we want, to build the, the great product, to build the pricing together. So it's really interesting to be in, in this uh, kind, of, uh, kind of process without being an insurer, but to have the, the hand on all of that. And we, we can focus on the product and the growth uh, since on, we don't sense. have a... These things. And the reason to get it though eventually in maybe two years time, what's the reason? Is it the reason it's to have cost uh, improvement? Yeah. Yes. I think for credibility it could be nice. Yeah. But uh, also to, to be bigger and to be uh, independent uh, sometimes. Yeah, makes sense. But for, for now it's working really well. Fantastic. Okay, questions. Who has the first question? There's a couple at the front here. We have this funny ball. I'll give it to you, and then you just throw it to the next person, okay? And you speak here <laughs> in the black thing, right? We start. Actually, this is a question for you, Rob. <laughs> so, you you spoke about uh, broker markets, right? Mm -hmm. um, what what did you say specifically about it was hard to crack, or what what was it that you said? I just find it interesting that most insurance is not sold by insurers directly to their customers. They're sold via brokers in the same way that travel used to be sold via travel agencies. Uh, and that's one of the few markets left where you have this intermediary in the middle selling your products on your behalf. And I, I, it's almost anachronistic to me in some ways. So that's still the case at the moment uh, mm -hmm. in Europe and, and Australia. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think that's the case? I think that's because the insurers are used to it. So there's a huge amount of inertia there that AXA are very reliant on their broker network. And anything AXA do that threatens a broker network is going to be deeply unpopular at AXA. Uh, and so any incumbent is really um, stuck into that. And it's very hard for them to change their approach. So that's why we need the people on stage to, to come and change that. Okay. But the, the consumer is the one that's buying the insurance anyway. So like the, the consumer... Mine needs to change as well. Yeah, no, or exactly. is there no yeah, option? It's up to us, it's up to the companies to convince the consumer why they need to change. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, this is a question I think for Leah and Hugo mostly because it's about partnering with the big bad insurance companies. Um, the question is, are there terms that were really, really hard to get into your agreements with them or that you wish you'd had gotten into your agreements with whichever reinsurers you work with. Sorry, was it hard to convince them uh, to work with us? Well, I mean, that maybe, yes. And also, uh, are there terms that were really hard to get, that you worked really, really hard to get into the agreement as you build a product with them? I'm new to this, so I'm just kind of, you know. No, it was, it was quite, a, quite a good process. Um, to, we didn't, they, they really trust in our vision. They are really interested in, in the protection part. And as Rob said, it could be quite difficult for traditional insurer to distribute insurance to, to find uh, these new people, to attract the, the website people, the new generation. So they, they are really they are really believing in the new actors in the startups like us. So it was uh, quite uh, easy to reach them and they are really uh, flexible. They, they really understand how we work, the, the flexibility we need. So we are really lucky to, to fund them and to, to work with them uh, on a daily basis because uh, of course, sometimes it's difficult because we want the answer now and they have to, they have to wait. We have to wait two days to have the answer. But Apart from them, it's really nice. Um, just to go more over this point, because we, we did this work six months ago, and you chose the white insurers, and they are really the, better, the best of the market, uh, Munich Ray, yeah. uh, digital partners, but most of them are more tricky to get, um, because you are going to market without volume, because you are going to market uh, disrupting an offer they are working on the same way since 20 years. 
So you really need to target the right ones. I think the biggest challenge I hear from insurance startups is around price. And they, the insurers, the price they initially get from the insurers is just too high. And they're just defensive and conservative. And it's that continual battle to get the pricing to be more competitive. Hello. Uh, just a quick question for uh, Lea and Hugo. Um, how long did you take to get your MGA, your agreement? I mean, uh, first you had your value proposition. You wanted to sell your insurance product, but then you, you had to wait and sign something to be able to actually uh, sell your product. How long did it take? Like MGA or Orias? Yeah, yeah uh, MGA, yeah. It's an MGA. You don't have MGA? No. no. <laughs> like a few months. A few months. Yeah. And, and, and for you to be able to... Or yes, like uh, three weeks or three weeks. a month. Yeah, they, are, they have one commission per month, something like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how do you work on your product? Like, uh, how do you structure your teams? How you organize the process? How do you improve the product in general? And how is it related to your improvement of the value proposition of the packages you, you provide to your clients? So the question, yeah, around products and how you structure your product teams, probably more for the, the bigger companies. Um, yeah, um, I can talk about it. Um, so the way, we, the way we work on product, uh, the product is anchored in our strategy uh, and uh, our ambition for, for each year. And I, I gave you an example of the fact that we've defined um, clear um, product pillars. Um, and then for each of them, uh, we work in crews. Um, so we said, so that's, that's, that's a pillar, let's take the, the pillar fluid and we want to deliver the best service and faster service. We defined what does that mean uh, for the next quarter. So we work on a, on a quarter, we, we do quarterly uh, road mapping. We define what do we want to, um, to achieve uh, on, on the product side on the quarter and we set up a, a crew um, that's usually cross-functional. You have product team, you have uh, eng teams, you um, obviously have the sales team um, quite, uh, quite, quite strongly involved in that. Um, and um, I think that's, I'm not, uh, I'm not the product expert, so I think that's, that's uh, um, um, what, I can, what I can share. And the, our, our product team, so we, um, every, everyone in the product team actually works in, um, in crews. And we have, I haven't shared there, but there's also um, product crews that are more internally focused. So work, working on the scalability of our product, working on our customer service tools, um, and that's one of the ways in which we deliver faster service. Um, and and yeah, and there's there's a maybe one other thing. There's a, there are crews that actually work on the insurance product, and that's a mix of the insurance team and the the product managers. Um, again, working very closely with input from from our sales team um, and with with the eng team. Uh, I have the question for Luko. Uh, as I understand, your claim management is extremely fast. Uh, so. Uh, usually, expertise of damage uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, how do you manage it? Do you provide detailed expertise? Uh, do you estimate the price uh, based on computer vision and artificial intelligence algorithm to detect leaks of water? So how do you manage to be extremely fast on claims? <laughs> The answer is quite fast. It was a technology. So when you have a claim at Luco, you can directly chat with them. And then the, 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 the process, the current process, is that you, you start a video call. So you can film uh, direct live your situation. You can uh, record the problem and we can see everything. And uh, if it's an easy claim, we can um, directly uh, like put a price on it, we, c we know how much we can pay you back, so we can do you a, a Lydia, we can do send you the money right away. And if it's a more complicated claim, if we need to, to send you an expert, uh, you send us photos and uh, we, we do as fast as we can to, to treat it. So it was really the main focus of Luco because our first thing when we launched Luco, it was get covered in two minutes and get payback in two hours for the, the simplest problem. So we worked really hard on that and we have to work also really hard about fraud, to detect fraud because some people can abuse the system. 
So it's really about technology and really fast process uh, intern. And we do handle all of this internally. So it's a really a quick win because uh, some insurers have a different system or different entities to deal with claims. So it it's can uh, get longer. So everything internally with a lot of technology. Uh, here I have another question. Uh, do you aim to be profitable very soon? Uh, if so, in which uh, horizon? So what's the horizon where you want to get profitability? Uh, uh, for <laughs> as we are startups and as we are looking for high growth and we are putting a lot of effort into growth, into innovation, into product, into prevention, we do not plan to be uh, profitable like next month, uh, but we, we deeply think that if we just do our job without uh, putting effort on growth or prevention, we can be profitable in a few years, but we are going to invest a lot of on our vision and how we see the insurance and the protection. So it's not for the two years coming, but uh, the, <laughs> the soonest, the best. But there is another question, which is the insurance part, because um, you, you have the profitability for your company, but your, your program, if your program is profitable or not. And this, we really need to monitor it daily, weekly, because the ratios need to be good. Uh, if you're your proper insurer with your, the license, it's an evidence, but when you are a broker, you have two customers, you have your end customer, and you have your insurer. Because the day your insurer don't want to um, be your insurer anymore, anymore, you don't have any more product. So you are really, really dependent of them. I think yeah. insurance is an industry where it's easy to grow by um, selling two dollars for one dollar by just underpricing. And I think yeah, it's as an investor, we have to see companies where the loss ratio is under control. In this case, uh, do Munich Re or Swiss Re put? Uh, pressure on the profitability also like with a specific objective in the coming years? Yeah, like uh, Munich Re, uh, the digital partners uh, are saying that they, are, they have the first global program around the world uh, in InsurTech profitable since last year. So we are, we are the first life cycle on this InsurTech uh, market since five years uh, we, where we didn't know this profit, profitability, and now we are going on the next step, which is we can prove to classic insurers that InsurTech could be profitable on the time. That's interesting, because you're the first one to mention insurers, whereas in the presentations it was only about reinsurers. So um, how do you feel, why do you, <clears throat> why do you not mention more insurers rather than reinsurers? Where do you see the role of current insurers rather than reinsurers? I think from my perspective, I think reinsurers are very open to startups. They want to work with startups. Uh, there's an interesting battle between insurers and reinsurers. So reinsurers want to get more in front of the market. Insurers are starting to self-reinsure. So there's a little bit of that context, and I think the insurers are more threatened by the startups, whereas the reinsurers see opportunity. Same. <laughs> so then how did you convince your insurer to work with you? Because I guess reinsurers have a reinsurance license, and insurers have an insurance license. So how do you do? You, you have an insurance in between? Or? Uh, usually, the reinsurer is working with a fronter and is choosing the fronter for you. So this is an insurance between your partner, the reinsurer, and you, the broker. But you don't have to choose the insurer for the reinsurer. Same. Same. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I have a question for Luco. What were the main challenges during your Series A fundraising? Uh, the, the Series A is uh, for three main things. So the first one is... <laughs> we are facing with the Series A to, to get, uh, to get the, the VC on board. Um, 
they, they, they really like uh, our metrics, that's why uh, they come to us, because we, we manage to have a lot of cl clients in a short time, and a lot of praise, uh, and uh, organic growth. So they were really challenging us on how we will build the brands, because it's really important to build a brand when you are doing B2C. So they, they ask us a lot about that. Uh, technical results, of course, they are challenging us on the portfolio of clients. They, w they would like to know if we are strong, if we are good on, on dealing with fraud. So it's really important, the technical results, because there is a lot of startups in insurance trying to have more and more clients doing a lot of marketing, but not attracting the, the good clients. And uh, yes, brand, technical results, and um, the acquisition channel. They would like to know how we acquire client, clients and what is uh, our acquisition cost. Really important because in insurance, it's a really challenging uh, industry. So the insurer uh, spend a lot of money to acquire clients. So they really, li they really like that we are spending less money to have clients. I think there's good context on this is that Alan had one of the fastest and most successful Series A fundraisers of, uh, of any European startup of the last few years. Uh, I think JC wrote a blog post about it, yeah, about how he did weeks. the fundraise. And two weeks. Uh, and then I think Raphael and Luco saw that as a challenge. And it was like, yeah. how do I do my Series A even faster than JC? And it was also incredibly competitive and a very fast process. So the good news is there's lots of appetite for insurance companies. Uh, and if you can show good traction, you're going to be very popular and you're going to get a lot of term sheets very fast. Then he has the mic. Yeah. So my question is primarily to Mihala. So um, what do you think about the potential to use um, genetic, um, genetics data in the pricing and where it's legal and the ethical questions around it? I think uh, it's, a, it's a whole conference to be had around <laughs> the ethical aspect of genetic th testing, so I, I actually, I, I, I ask not to, act, to not go into that detail. Um, I think from, uh, from a service, from a health service perspective, um, we are actually looking at a broad range of, uh, of healthcare explorations and services that we might want to, uh, might want to provide to, um, to our members. Um, we haven't made a particular decision on whether we want to uh, reimburse or provide in any way um, the more classic uh, tests, um, but I would prefer not to share an opinion on uh, genetic testing in general, unless there is something specific around uh, insurance that you had in mind. Well, in terms of how it's, it's integrated into, potentially integrated into pricing or not integrated where it's legal, and in terms of, and in terms of wearables, like you serve data from wearable devices um, for, for health insurance pricing, is that something um, that you have, that you do or have considered? Um, so when we looked at the, the space and what are some of the things that we can offer on that side, we've looked at it. Um, we haven't prioritized that in our uh, like shorter term uh, roadmap. Um, I think in general there is, a, there is discussion around uh, it's good to use the data from wearables to reward behaviors. Um, I think in, in terms of actually using that data to uh, penalize, in a way, uh, beneficiaries, that's a more complex discussion. And uh, you know, for, for the moment, we're not, we're not going into that, that space. Okay, I think we have to do the last question now. Um, so you want to throw to someone? Terrible throw. <laughs> <laughs> So my question is for Rob. Um, what's the appetite for B2B insurance startups selling to like b big insurance companies, uh, like for example, automating claims? So what's the appetite for B2B insurance companies? I think we have two of the most successful French insurance companies here. The one we don't have is Shift Technologies, which is a B2B insurance play all around fraud control. Um, and that has raised a lot of money uh, from some great VCs um, and is doing very well. So I think there is appetite. Um, and I've looked at a bunch of companies in that area. Um, I, what we want to see is how can someone build a real technology advantage uh, rather than just take your policy admin system uh, and put it in the cloud and make it 20% better. How can you do something that's really different in, in B2B insurance? Um, 
I mean, one of the best VC investments of all time was a B2B insurance play, a company called Guidewire in the US, which raised less than $50 million and became worth $5 billion plus. Um, so you can absolutely build a great company in B2B insurance. If you guys would add anything to that. Okay, one more. Not to me. A question for Luco and for all of you. <laughs> Have you considered going to, looking to other markets, especially the African market? We think of, uh, there is no real uh, digital insurance there. So, Have you considered looking into that one? Yes, we, we are considering to go outside France. And uh, in fact, uh, with the Series A, one of the objectives is to open two new countries in Europe first. I think we are going to this market first, and then uh, we will uh, we will hope uh, I hope we can go beyond like uh, North Afri Africa and uh, everywhere. Um, I think uh, uh, so. From from Alan's perspective, we want to uh, we want to be international, and we are opening uh, next year uh, two new countries in Europe: uh, Belgium and Spain. Um, and maybe a reflection on an earlier point, the fact that we have uh, the license, it's actually a, health, a European health insurance license, so that, that helps us. Um, and obviously, the, that's where we want to make, make prove that we can be successful internationally with two countries next year. Uh, and after that, uh, obviously, the aspiration is to, uh, to go beyond in Europe and even beyond Europe longer term. Okay, I think we have to stop there. Uh, we'll be around for more questions, but... Um Thank you, Hugo, Anna, and Mahela. Um, thank and thank you for the audience. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.